Hi, welcome to the Trauma and Resilience Podcast. I'm Ricky Robertson. Today, our guest is Cornelius Minor. Cornelius is an educator, author, and co-founder, along with Cass Minor, of the Minor Collective, which works to build healthy school communities. Cornelius, welcome to the program. Ricky, it's so exciting to be here alongside you. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, fantastic. So I want to I wanna dive in with, you know, Cornelius, you're kind of known for having a, a passion for literacy and building relationships with students and really creating curriculums where students get to see themselves reflected in what they're learning and engaged in meaningful ways in the learning journey. But I'm curious about your own your own journey as a, as a young person, if there was a moment for you personally when you discovered kind of the power of, of reading. Absolutely, Ricky. You know, I am I have been defined my whole life by curiosity. Like I was that kid, right? Like I would go up the tree to see how bad it hurt if I fell down. I would like, you know, eat any curious food that I encountered in a restaurant. Like that was like always me. Um, but like my connection to books um, wasn't always as strong. You know, I was insatiably curious, um, but I had never been like really connected to books in any profound way. Now, of course, in the 21st century now, we know that the world is a text, right? Anything is a text. But at the time, I was told that if you don't read books, you're not smart, you know, like, you know, and, and, and I was lucky enough to have a high school librarian, Judy McClure Saratella, and I shout her out at every moment who she went out of her way to find books for me to read. And I fell in love with um, comic books like many teens do. And my first like really powerful reading experience was Hardware Number One by Dwayne McDuffie. And um, I read that book. It was the first book that I'd ever read from cover to cover. And I was so moved by it that I wrote a letter. And this is back before email. So I hand wrote a letter to the author and um, Dwayne McDuffie, the legendary um, comic book creator. And he printed my letter in the back of Hardware Number Seven. Wow. So kind of like my very first literacy experience, I kind of became a surprise author. Um, <laughs> and so if for all my comic book fans out there, if you go to your vintage comic book shop and you search the stacks, if you find hardware number seven, there is a letter in the back of that book from 13 year old Cornelius in the back wow. of that book. And um, I kind of started my journey both as a reader and as a writer. And so I'm curious, was there any point then after that where, where reading really started to feel like a refuge for you? Was it was it ever an experience? I, I grew up with a grandmother who used to always say, you're never alone as long as you have a book, right? And so exactly. for me, reading became, um, like books became like a companion uh, and, yeah. and a friend yeah. in a way. And, and so I'm curious for absolutely. you. Absolutely. And it wasn't just a refuge. It was hmm. the community that I built. You know, I was really lucky. Um, periodicals were my thing. And um, in the 90s, when I was in high school, um, my mom got me a subscription to the Source magazine, which at that time was the definitive periodical on hip hop. Again, this is like when the internet was nascent. Yeah. So there was no yeah. like message boards or chat rooms or social media or anything like that. But every month I got the Source magazine and I was the only kid in my grade that had it. And so I would read it from cover to cover. So I knew all of the latest albums that are coming out. I knew all of the interviews. I knew all of the profiles of all the artists. And so there was a community that developed around me because people wanted to get my take on like music. And so <laughs> reading wasn't just like a refuge, but it became this yeah. community where every month when people knew the magazine had come out, they would hang out around my locker to hear about like the latest albums that I'd read about or the latest albums that I was listening to. So I kind of became this kind of like music community curator because I yeah. read. Right. And then that extended into other areas of culture. And so people would ask me about like sneaker culture or people would come around and like, and here's the funny thing, Ricky, I was like a nerd. Like, so I was like, not the typical cool kid, but because I was well read in all of these areas of popular culture, people um, considered me at the center of whatever community that they were having around these things. And I'm curious, are there ways that you see that that shaped you then as an educator? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That. I would argue that 100% of my pedagogy is built around that idea of co-constructing community alongside young people that, mm -hmm. that I saw, you know, like I had socially, I had very little going for me as a high school student. You know, I was like, um, I was an immigrant kid. I was kind of like a little, you know, nerdy. I was a little on the small side, but what I lacked socially, I had 
you know, connectively, like I had, you know, in my ability to like connect with other people and, and it was always through the world and it was always through text. Right. Um, and, and not just like academic texts, you know, because people tend to privilege those in school spaces, mm -hmm. but it was the text that really governed how my peers saw the world. So it was like text about hip hop and text about like fashion and sneakers, like that those were, those are my ends. And so those are still my ends now. You know, my very first professional article as an educator, um, I had a group of young people, I was working with them and they were obsessed with Pokemon. And so my very first peer reviewed <laughs> article as an educator, I wrote about, I did this kind of textual lineage of Pokemon where like that's all the kids that I was teaching were talking about. And so if I wasn't fluent in Pokemon, I couldn't reach them. Right. And so I had to become yeah. fluent in Pokemon so that I could speak their language. And so that idea of like community co-construction, meeting kids where they are, is at the center of my pedagogy. What you just shared was such a powerful example of really kind of the student centered instruction and, and this this, like you said, this co-creation and this relationship that gets formed around learning. And I think that that's such an important thing to highlight, because in this series, we've talked about supporting students impacted by adverse childhood experiences and trauma and the power of relationships as a protective factor. And I think it's important for teachers to see that that relationship very much can inform the learning journey and the learning process. And, and I'm curious, Absolutely. you know, what advice do you have for an educator when they are, you know, beginning a school year or they're, or they're attempting to shift from, I'm going to teach you know, for me, I was a high school math teacher, so I'm going to teach math to students versus I'm going to teach students math like that, like putting them at the center. What is your kind of guidance for educators on how they can go about doing that? Absolutely. Well, I think intentionality is everything for mm -hmm. me that like that relationships that we cultivate in a classroom are not incidental, rather they are intentional. So, mm -hmm. so just like someone would be intentional about curating a relationship if they wanted to, um, for example, find a best friend or something like that, like I'm just as intentional when I am coming into a classroom. And so there are three things that I always hold tightly to. Um, that it's not just about being nice or kind, right? That there are some folks who are saying, well, I'm nice or I'm kind, and I still can't find an in in this relationship, mm -hmm. right? That, that everybody that's kind doesn't, I'm not best friends with them, right? Like, you know, like that if if we forge powerful relationships on kindness alone, we'd all be best friends with everyone, right? And so the first thing that I always say is that students have to see that the way that the classroom develops is flexible. And so one of the first things that I want to do early in the year is I want to listen to kids and then I want to illuminate the ways that what kids have articulated have impacted the culture of the classroom. Mm -hmm. So early in the year, I might say, oh, Ricky had this idea yesterday um, in math. Instead of like counting marbles, we're going to count Pokemon. And so I switched the math a little bit today just to match Ricky's idea. When I say that to the class, Ricky doesn't just feel heard. But everybody now knows that here is a teacher who's willing to be flexible around the things that students prioritize. Um, so I try to do that early in the year as often as possible. The second thing that I try to do is I try to be really transparent about my own learning and my own growth. So I'll say, you know, yesterday I was the kind of teacher who does this. Like yesterday I was the kind of teacher who really only saw one way through this problem. But as I listened to you all yesterday, especially as I hang out with Ricky, I can tell that there's more than one way through this problem. And so today I'm the kind of teacher who sees more than one way through this problem. And so when kids see that, that, oh my gosh, he has shifted because of like what Ricky said, or he has shifted because of Ricky's approach to that math problem. Like, again, that helps students to like build that relationship. Again, not everybody will be my best friend, yeah. but everyone can trust me to shepherd them on this journey toward math proficiency or toward language arts proficiency. Um, and then the third thing that I think a lot about is I also want to be like flexible in the experience of school, right? Mm -hmm. That people will invest in things that feel custom made to them, right? And so if I come into a classroom and I say, well, you know, I need everybody's math notebook like this, your name on the upper left-hand side, your, you know, your problems going down the right column, like 
for what? <laughs> like, you know, like I want to get to proficiency. And so one of the things that I talked to kids about is I was like, okay, so today we're going to be factoring these polynomials, right? And there are several different ways that you can show me proficiency. You can show me proficiency by walking through these polynomials in your notebook. So when I see them like scripted in your notebook, I'll know that you're moving toward proficiency. But also some people talk their way through math problems. So another way that you can show me proficiency is if you record a short video or audio talking me through some of the day's problems. Or there are some people who understand math conceptually and visually. So if you build a model or a diagram that shows me that you understand these polynomials, that counts too. So before I let you off and do your work today, can you please like indicate the way that you want to approach today's math? One, if you want to write out the problems. Two, if you want to talk them out. Three, if you want to illustrate them. And that gives kids that flexibility. They're like, wait a minute, this guy like is creating space in this classroom ecosystem for me to be me. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I often like build in options that way for kids. And 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 again, it's not about being your best friend, even though I hope that I'll be friends with everybody. Rather, it's about crafting a shared community where everyone feels like they have a place. Um, and if I craft a shared community that leaves out the kids who think illustratively, then that yeah. relationship is deteriorated. Or if I craft a classroom community that leaves out the kids who have to talk their way through a math problem, then that relationship get, gets deteriorated. So it's not just about being best friends, but it's about creating that shared ecosystem where we can share power. What are some of the qualities then that you as the educator have to embody in that journey, right? Like I heard the flexibility, yeah. but I also heard things like humility and, and, and you know, honoring your own growth and okay, now I know better, so I'm gonna do better and, and modeling that. Exactly. Exactly. And that's been a huge part of it. Like, um, but one of the things, and I, I know this sounds like a silly thing to talk about in a podcast on trauma and resilience, but joy Yes, that, yes. that I think, uh, yeah, I think a lot of times what happens is I get so caught up in my language arts or I get so caught up in my mathematics that I forget that at the end of the day, mm -hmm. these kids are 13 and mm -hmm. this is fun. Right. And 13 year olds want to laugh. Right. And 13 year olds want to move around a lot and they want to, you know, like draw pictures and like be with friends. And so like, I don't ever want to lose sight of childhood because math or I don't ever want to yeah. lose sight of of adolescence because language arts or because standards. Right. And I think that sometimes joy is so buried in a classroom because people are being standards based. Or, or love and laughter is so buried in a classroom because people are being objective based. Um, and so I want to make sure that I center those things. I couldn't agree more about the power of, of joy in terms of healing and well-being. And you talked about love and joy. And I think it's also an important conversation, you know, when we're so, so many educators, I think can relate to what you're saying about the pressure to be standards based and keep up with the pacing curriculum. And, and there's this, you know, incredible controversy we're in the midst of across our country around what books can be included in a classroom library, right? And, and, and what histories are allowed Absolutely. to be taught. And I think that you've illustrated so powerfully is how important it is for students to have a voice in the classroom, have their lived experience honored, mm -hmm. and how critical that is to support their learning. Yeah. And I'm, I'm wondering, can you think of examples where, and you've shared a number of them in terms of Pokemon, et cetera, but, but some of the ways that you, mm -hmm. as you're getting to know students and you're making those curriculum shifts, how you're intentional about also honoring their lived experience in terms of the text that you're choosing and, and I guess just how the impact you see of that. Like mm -hmm. what does it do for a young person's Absolutely. well being to make those choices as an educator? Well, I think it it does everything for a young person's well being, you know, um, and it does everything for an educator's well being as well. Mm -hmm. That anytime we use our gifts to see the humanity in others it lifts the humanity in ourselves. And I think that that's a really important thing. And anything I do to diminish the humanity of another person, even if I don't initiate that thing, it erodes my own humanity, right? So when I go along with unjust laws that say, we don't talk about women or black folks or queer folks in this classroom, that diminishes my humanity too, even if I'm not a woman, even if I'm not black, even if I'm not queer. And I think that that's really important to name that this, kind of articulation of 
of, of hate that is showing up now in law, um, it doesn't just diminish the humanity of the people who wrote the laws. It diminishes the humanity of the good people who go along with those laws. And I think that that's really important to name. And so when we talk about qualities of good teaching, one such quality of good teaching is bravery. I think. And I think about this in very concrete ways. Like one of the things that like I'm in New York City, you know, and one of the things that I'm dealing with, like I'm in middle school. Right. And so kids walk to school every day in one of the busiest cities on the planet. Mm -hmm. And a big part of my work is helping to teach kids the social literacy skills to help them be safe on their way to and from school. And there was one morning where there was a young lady who was late to class and I noticed that she'd been late. Um, And so I asked her, um, as is protocol at school, um, you sit with either the school counselor or with me when you're late. And so the school counselor happened to be in the room. And so I just kind of mentioned to the school counselor that she was late. And I asked her, I was like, you know, we really miss you when you're not here on time. Is everything okay? Um, And one of the things that she said to me, she was like, yeah, there's a guy that stands four blocks away from the school. And every time I pass him, he comments on my dress or he comments on my body in some way. Mm. It's a 13 year old Mm -hmm. kid I'm talking about Mm -hmm. here. Um, And I realized that I have a 13 year old in my class who's being street harassed. Mm -hmm. And so, and her solution was instead of passing that man because he scares me, I take the long way around. Mm -hmm. And so I take the long way around the block. Um, And so I was dealing with an issue of harassment right here. And so I look at the school counselor. um, And one of the things that I realized was, of course, we needed to like contact parents and build systems of support for the student. But I was like, if I am not talking about gender and harassment in class, I am doing my students a disservice and potentially putting them in danger. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, And so what I did was we gathered the school counselor is brilliant. And so she helped me gather so many books um, about like young women and community and safety. So we read just like so widely. We read E.B. Zaboy and Sharon Mm -hmm. Flake. We read, you know, like lots of like really cool things that really centered the experience of girls and women and gave them not just like conversation starters to talk about some of these issues, but tools to navigate some of these issues and strategies to eliminate some of these issues, right? Now, had I taken the stance as a teacher that says, well, you know, I've got to leave gender out of things because that's political, Mm -hmm. like my students would be in danger right now, you know? And so I think when we talk about qualities of powerful teaching, part of it is bravery. Part of it says, you know what, I'm going to look at these unjust laws that are being written, but I'm also going to look at the lives and identities and truths that my students bring to class every day. And I'm going to choose to honor those. Right. You know, and so it's that idea um, that that sometimes like justice and legality sit in different courts. I get goosebumps from you sharing that, because what I also hear in it is this way that you took an experience where the student safety was being threatened. But also there can be so much shame if that experience is brushed under the rug or ignored or not acknowledged. And then it can leave the person experiencing it feeling even more isolated. And not only did you destroy the, 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 the shame that could have gotten attached to that um, and, and help that student to, to learn ways to, 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 to feel safer, but I, I would imagine that also for other students in the class who maybe hadn't experienced that form of harassment, it also taught them about ways to, to be an ally or to disrupt situations like that and and to to broaden their capacity for empathy and so there's something about this way that the way you taught that affirmed the lived experience of that student also helped other students that had different lived experiences build that empathic bridge Absolutely. You know, and there were some powerful moments there. You know, I I remember specifically one of the texts that we chose was Nikki Grimes's Bronx Masquerade. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's a page in that book that I argue is probably the most important page in all of young adult literature. We're all talking about these issues. And this young man, he read this page and like he didn't cry, but he did that like shudder that you're about to do when you're about to cry. Um, And so I kind of like maneuvered myself in the classroom and I went to stand next to him. And he was just like, I'm reading this chapter and I think this might happen to more than one girl. I think this happens to lots of women. And so to watch a teenage boy discover Mm -hmm. like 
street or street harassment through literary analysis mm -hmm. and then to watch him make the universal connection from his classmate to women all over the world was a really powerful moment for me as a teacher and like and i did no work i simply provided the opportunity and the space for kids to do that work now what's interesting is i teach language arts so we did it all through character study and literary analysis, yep. but allowing the character study and literary analysis to live in a way where a kid can make the connection from his classmates to women all over the world was a really powerful moment for me. And, and that doesn't happen if teachers aren't audacious, right? I could have easily said, well, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird is on the curriculum, so we're going to stick with that. Mm -hmm. But I said, you know, like there are you know, kids here who are dealing with issues in the community. And so I can still teach literary analysis, even if I don't use To Kill a Mockingbird, that I am going to substitute that book out and substitute in a book that speaks to the lived experience that walks into my classroom every morning at 820. Um, and I think that that's an important skill for teachers, that that doesn't mean that I'm sidestepping a curriculum. That simply means that I'm drawing a curriculum that's a lot closer to the students that occupy my classroom. Yeah, and you're building both the skills that they need to be successful in the classroom, but also in life, right? You're teaching both this way that they're engaged in literary analysis and they're building their capacity for empathy, for self-advocacy, yeah. for honoring their self-worth. I mean, there's so much connected to that that supports the well-being of students. I'm then curious about your own well-being, right? To be able to emotionally attune to a classroom of middle school students, right? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Ricky, that's a whole thing right there. Who goes back? Who, who says, you know, I would, I'd really like to feel like what it's like to be 13 again emotionally, right? Like, but that, exactly. to be able to emotionally yeah. attune to a classroom, middle, middle school students, that's a certain amount of, of emotional labor, so to speak, on the, on the part of the educators. So I'm, I'm curious, how do you that's support brilliant. your own well-being? I stay in community with colleagues like, you know, and Ricky, it's interesting. I actually just left the principal's office and um, and I feel like I should shout her out at every time. But Principal Paula Latier, I just sat in her office and took a breath. Um, and she's the kind of principal who understands that. Like when there's a colleague that comes into the office and takes a heavy breath, she knows what that means, you know, and so she's built a collaborative ecosystem at school where she's just named what we're doing isn't only hard, but what we're attempting to build for children hasn't really been sustained, mm -hmm. you know, in America before, specifically what we're attempting to build for black children and brown children and poor children and queer children. Like this hasn't really been sustained in any significant way. And so she recognizes the emotional and the intellectual labor. There are days where even when I feel fatigued, I'm able to show up because my teammates do, if that makes sense. And so in the way that families and communities work, I think schools need to work in the same way. That there's this whole mythology around teachers and how we're perfect or how we're heroes. And I think that that mythology is not just flawed and untrue, but that mythology also robs us of nuance, right? Yeah. That there are days where I'm broken. And there are days where like, I can't see my way through, um, but I'm in community with other people who might be able to that day, right? Mm. And I'm in community with people who might not be broken on that day. And so I think the work is hard and I think I have lots of bad days and those bad days are all played out in public. Yeah. Um, but I also belong to a community of people who understand that and expect that. And the more that we can make schools operate that way, where I'm not showing up and expecting Ricky to be perfect, rather I'm showing up and expecting Ricky to be human. Because there's a lot of lessons in that. Like um, that there are often times where I'll have to say to a group of students, you know, the way I chose to handle that thing, um, I, I, like I drew from my stress mm. and not from how well I know you all. Mm. Or the way I choose to handle that thing, I drew from my anger and not who I know you to be. Right. And so to be able to name that and to use that kind of restorative language about myself with kids is instructive because I want them to use that kind of restorative language with themselves. And so every opportunity that I have to evaluate my own movement and my own behavior in public, 
I take that because that's a mentor for how other kids can do that, right? That if I want to be in community with boys who are thoughtful about street harassment and who know to call it out as allies, right? Yeah. Then I have to model that for them. Or if I want to be in community with people who know how to upstand for members of our Jewish community or members of our queer community, I have to be able to do that in public as well. Hmm. So. I appreciate that you highlighted both showing up in relationship with our students as well as showing up in relationship with our colleagues and the power of that. And I was I was about to ask the question of kind of, you know, I when I reflect on my own teaching career, I can think of some deep regrets of moments where I didn't, I was not my best self, right? And like you said, it happens publicly. And for me, those were moments when I was either dysregulated and and like you said, coming from my stress, right? Or they were moments when I taught the curriculum first rather than my students, right? And and those are two moments where I, I have the deepest regrets because I, I think I either threw fuel on the fire and ended up in a power struggle with a student, or I got so focused on my standardized tests and the pacing calendars that I left students feeling deficient in some way, like they, like they couldn't keep up because of the stress of the system. And that was certainly never something I wanted to leave my students with a feeling that somehow they couldn't learn or couldn't learn at the pace that that I, I needed them to because of, of, a, of a calendar or an exam. And, and those are some of my deepest exactly. deepest regrets. And I think the way that you spoke about modeling for students that accountability, that humility, that restorative language in the classroom is so powerful. And we sometimes have to show that with our colleagues, those moments when we say to, a, yeah. to another adult that we work alongside with, you know, I apologize yeah. or we express gratitude yes. because we're so often contributing to each other. I mean, we can't do it alone, right? So we, we yeah. need each other in this work. I've really been fascinated with the idea of community, that there is an expectation in education that when I become a staff member or when I become a student, I am a member of a community that has already been constructed. And I think, again, that that's a flawed idea. Rather, we come together to construct community with each other, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that process is imperfect. And so I have been really um, thinking out loud in as many spaces as will, will allow me to do it, including at school, where I talk about, all right, we're all colleagues that teach seventh grade, and we're coming together to form this community. And the process of building community is imperfect, right? And so people were like, well, the seventh grade team should have a protocol for this, or we should have an approach to this. And I'm like, well, that's what community is. That means community is we build it together, right? So it doesn't already exist because if it already existed and we walked into it, that's not our community, you know? And so the expectation that community should already exist before its participants get there, I think is an expectation that keeps school from being humane humanity we find in the messy process of forging community. So mm -hmm. it's Ricky and Cornelius coming together to be math teachers next door to each other and figuring out what it means to teach math to this group of kids this year, right? That we could easily occupy a structure. Well, this is how math has been taught here for the last 20 years. Yep. So we'll just walk into that structure. But that structure doesn't honor you as the pedagogue and it doesn't honor the kids that have assembled to learn alongside us. And so I'm really learning to publicly in not just embrace the muck of forging community, but to articulate it. So while we're moving through it and people feel uncomfortable, I pointed out that that discomfort that you feel is us building community. And if we walked into something more comfortable, it wouldn't be us. I love the way for me that creates like a difference between between prioritizing niceness, right? Like I, I, I know schools that, that where niceness is like the top priority versus authenticity and an authenticity yes. that that obviously is is grounded in mutual respect and in offering ourselves and one another grace but but is messy and difficult and at times uncomfortable yeah. but a heck of a lot more meaningful than just ignoring conflict or tough conversations just to to privilege yeah. niceness right versus real exactly. authentic kindness and and sometimes conflict that's productive yeah and Ricky, and that's the heart of your work. You know, we can't get to resilience without authenticity, mm -hmm. right? You know, and so I think about that a lot, that if what I want is resilience and what I want is 
restoration and what I want is beloved community, that doesn't happen, you know, by being nice, you know, it happens by really engaging with each other. You know, I talk to kids often about resilience and how problematic resilience is as a word, even yes. in school space, mm -hmm. right? That, that, that really what we want is systemic change, right? That I don't want, you know, resilience, I tell kids all the time, is something that you employ to deal with something that threatens your well-being, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so one employs resilience anytime I have to deal with something that threatens my well-being. And I tell kids that the work of an educator is really to remove the thing that threatens your well-being. Yes. You know, every time I ask you to be more resilient, I am asking you to abide a thing that threatens your well-being and that thing will continue to persist if we don't remove it. Right. Absolutely. And so I talk about resilience as a tool that we employ while we're sharpening our ability to build systemic change that anyone who consistently asks you over time to be resilient doesn't love you, yeah. right? Because yeah. they haven't removed the thing that threatens your well-being in the first place. And so I'm always talking to kids about, okay, what are we gonna be resilient around? Mm -hmm. And then while we're building that resilience, like what are the tools that we use to remove the thing that harms us, yeah. right? And so, and, and how do we identify those things? Um, and that has been really beautiful work to do with teenagers. Yeah. And it's been beautiful work to do alongside other teachers because all kids really are really thoughtful about the things that harm them, mm -hmm. you know, and they've studied those things. They've spent a lot of time harboring feelings about those things. And so to name that this is a classroom space where we get to think about those things and build tools to remove those things, um, that's big work. And we talk about relationship building. Kids are all into that kind of work, yeah. right? And so when I say to kids, you know, the thing that harms you is the fact that you can't read and that bothers you, you know, that you don't read like you want to read yet and you're 13 and that bothers you. And I know that does. And so so we're going to build some tools around that, like, you know, that, that I can't wave a magic wand that will turn you into the world's best reader tomorrow. But what I can do is build you a set of tools that allows you to feel less embarrassment. What I can do is build you a set of tools that allows you to feel more confident when you show up. What I can build you is a set of tools that allows you to recruit people to your side when you need support or assistance, you know, and being yeah. able to name those things in specific terms for kids, because that's what teenagers want when they show up. That's what kids want. They want to feel safe and they want to know that there are allies in the corner if they need them. Right. Yeah. They want to know, like, are there tools, you know, and so to say to a kid, I can show you how to find the allies and how to summon them when you need it. That's really powerful. And I can show you all of that in the context of language arts. And then you go next door to Ricky's class and he's going to show you all of that in the context of math. That's how we build relationships, you know, making those guarantees and then showing kids that, all right, so it's been six weeks that we've been together. Not only do you have like an 82 or an 83 in language arts, but also you know what to do when you encounter trouble in a text. Yes. You know how to summon help. You know how to form a question. You know how to reduce embarrassment. And to name those skills for kids is really important. Really, the first step in any journey for a school or district to engage in trauma-informed work or work around resilience is to identify and disrupt the practices that cause yeah. harm. And that is to students yes. as well as to staff and to families. Educators are so often told what to do and, and so rarely asked what they need that when when I ask them to think about what, what are the practices that are causing you harm within your school or district that are contributing to your fatigue or moral trauma or stress in your relationships. And, and part of the work is for them to identify that. And then what collective practices can we do to make school a space that supports your well-being? So in turn, you can do that work with students and families. My first real lesson in this, I was working with a group of seventh graders, as I always do. And um, we were noticing that a lot of the young men, um, specifically young men with IEPs were being sent out of the room for like, you know, discipline issues. Um, and, and one month we looked back at our office referral data and it was just really embarrassing where there were so many like young men with IEPs and it almost felt like that they were in some way being systemically targeted. And I'm like, well, how can this be me? How can this be my colleagues? We're all nice people. Mm -hmm. um, and as we dug down into that, we were lucky enough to have kids who were thoughtful and gave us really good feedback. But some of the kids were just like, you all ask us to sit still for 40 minutes while you talk to us sometimes. Yeah. Um, and that's really, really hard. And so my colleagues and I asked ourselves the question, what if we disrupted the practice 
of demanding that kids sit still for 40 minutes at a time? And what if we um, employed other pedagogical moves in the spaces where we are want to desire you know, kids to sit still for 40 minutes. And just by like employing more talk moves, employing more opportunities to work in partnerships, employing more opportunities for kids to like move around the room, we saw the data in office referrals fall overnight. And so the thing that was like hurting kids wasn't me being mean or unkind or me doing bad things. The thing that was hurting kids was me subscribing to a set of pedagogies that demanded that kids sit still for 40 minutes, right? And, and so the moment I disrupted that practice, kids felt more at ease and were visibly and measurably more successful at school because it did not demand that they had to regulate themselves in such strict and specific ways. And so I've really been thinking lots about not just what are the practices that harm kids, but sometimes what are the invisible practices or the invisible customs that harm kids? Because that's just a custom in the social studies department that people have been lecturing your kids for 40 minutes for generations, mm -hmm. right? But really learning from the kids that us sitting still for 40 minutes doesn't work for us. Could you offer another way? And then us being willing to offer another way, we saw a dramatic reduction in office referrals. And so it's that too. In terms of your own journey as an educator, and particularly as, as you've, you've focused so much on co-creating community and listening to students, is there a book or a resource that, that you have read that has really deepened your practice as an educator that you would recommend? Several, several, several. Um, my life was changed when I read Gloria Latson Billings, The Dream Keepers. And so like, I will always return to that book. Um, it is a treasure in my library. I have that book in every location. So I have that book at school. I have that book at home. Um, so I have the book in every location. Um, also, the book that's really been speaking to me kind of like during the pandemic and since is Carla Shalaby's Troublemakers. Mm -hmm. For me, has been the most practical guide to what young people are experiencing right now. And it was written before the pandemic, yeah. but it has become more essential to me as we move through it and are attempting to resolve it. I am also thinking lots right now about the pedagogy itself, mm. that there are so many people who think about the content, but I've been really thinking a lot about the delivery. What does it mean to deliver content to young people in ways that are humane and child-centered? And so for me, that journey has started with Alfred Tatum um, and his seminal book, um, Teaching Reading to Adolescent Black Boys. I think it's an essential book, even if you don't teach reading, even if you don't teach adolescents, even if the kids that you teach aren't Black, that that book has really been about how, you know, one of the things that I have really just internalized is that for the history of my career, so much of teaching has been like performing the lesson plan. And that book really kind of like switched my view and it really helped me to understand that teaching is not performing the lesson plan, rather teaching is ensuring kids stay on the path to proficiency, mm -hmm. right? And so it's not this performance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of a script yeah. that I'm going after that constitutes a good lesson, but it's like how like joyful is the path to proficiency? Mm -hmm. And that book really helped me to understand that. Thank you. Um, and then yeah. last question, Reflecting on your journey as an educator, what is one way that this work has changed you? That's huge. Um, you know, we're all human and I wanna start there. Like um, that this work has illuminated the areas where I still need to grow. That there is no mirror more clear than the mirror that young people hold back up to you. And sometimes I don't love what I see. Like, you know, in the times when I'm impulsive, young people show me. In the times when I am judgmental, young people show me. In the times where I am impatient or, or, or angry, young people show me. And so I think this journey to always be better for kids has somehow kind of put me in a position where I have to be better for myself and for my family and for my community. Um, and that's the thing not enough of us talk about, you know, and, and so it's definitely changed me in that way. It's also made me a little sad, you know, like Ricky earlier, we talked about like the state of our country and the state of our world. Um, and there is a real anger, like inside me when I look around sometimes and I see 
you know, the rights of our queer siblings being abridged or the rights of our, you know, black or Latinx or Jewish siblings being abridged. Like there's a real anger, but not just the rights being abridged by like people who seek to do harm, but by people who seek to architect law, right? By people who seek to to build community around the idea of exclusion, that there's a real outrage that like I'm feeling right now. Mm. And so um I think the work has changed me in that way. I didn't used to be an angry person until my heart lived in so many communities. And when we see what those communities have been made to endure in the name of America or in the name of like, you know, whatever, you know, folks want to call themselves as they organize for injustice, I'm learning that, oh, like my anger is just as deep as my joy. And I think we're entitled to that. Mm -hmm. as educators like we love so many people and in so many communities and so it should move us to outrage when there's so much happening in the world around us and so like and so those are kind of some of the changes that i've been reflecting on um especially recently thank you cornelius thank you for this opportunity it has meant a lot to be able to talk with you and to learn from you and I appreciate and value your authenticity and so much of the, the richness you shared with us today. We'll put a link in the show notes for folks who are interested in learning more about Cornelius's work and the Minor Collective. Thank you so much. Mm, thank you, Ricky. The Trauma and Resilience series is made possible by a partnership between the National Education Association and WETA. For more information, please visit adlit.org slash trauma. Trauma and Resilience is available on YouTube and on every major podcast platform. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to the whole series so you won't miss an episode. Thank you.